All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, this talk on Yarn Spinner, which is a tool for interactive dialogue. Uh, my name is John Manning, and uh, I worked on uh, Bits of Night in the Woods, which is um, what you can see running here. So um, I'm here to talk to you today about the tool that uh, we wrote that manages all the dialogue in this game, and also how you can use it in your games, what it's useful for, and how to extend it and basically make it really cool. Um, I anticipate that there will be a lot of room for questions at the end, so um, that's cool. So um, I'm 50% of a studio in Tasmania called Secret Lab. Um, the other half are, uh, is in the corner over there, Wave Paris. Um, and uh, we're also working on a game called Leonardo's Moonship, which is an adventure game with a really pretty hand-drawn look. We're really excited about that. Um, and I'm also an author. We recently wrote a book about Unity, and we think it's pretty great. This is a shameless plug. Please go buy it. Um, so Night in the Woods was developed by uh, a team called Infinite Fall uh, and published by Finji. Finji are best known for, right now, Overland and Tunic. They also uh, were the team behind games like Cannibalt. Um, we at Secret Lab helped out by writing the dialogue engine that uh, powers all the conversations in the game. And I'll talk in some detail about um, what that involves and uh, why we made the choices that we did. So we're talking about, first of all, the game Night in the Woods. So the uh, setting for why this tool and why this tool uh, did what it did. Um, we'll talk about existing tools that are out there for managing dialogue uh, that you may or may not have heard of already. And then I'll go into uh, in depth what Yarn Spinner is and um, just how it's used. Then we'll talk about some customization stuff, and then we'll have some time for Q and A. So, to catch you up on what this is all about, Night in the Woods is an adventure game that was released in February of this year. Um, it did pretty well, um, I think. So, in the game, you play as May Borowski, who's a recent college dropout uh, who's moved back in home with her, with her parents in the Rust Belt, uh, in a very, very small dying town called Possum Springs. Um, some of her friends are <laughs> pleased to see her, and some of them are not. So, May's hometown of Possum Springs is slowly dying, the mines have closed, nobody has any good jobs, and there's a quiet feeling of desperation that's been sinking into the town for years. So May tries to settle back into her life, uh, and she finds all of her friends have moved on with their lives, and she really has not. So, and also, meanwhile, strange things are happening at, uh, at night, and there's something in the woods. So the gameplay of Night in the Woods is largely concerned with dialogue. So you spend a lot of time talking to other characters. <laughs> because of the amount of dialogue in this game, we needed some tool to manage it in. And as is usual with any kind of uh, anything, the constraints that the uh, team faced determined the technology mix that we ended up with. So the art was primarily done by one person. Um, he was one of the two main writers, a person named Scott Benson. Um, so everything you're seeing here is done by him. Um, Bethany Hockenberry, who's Scott's wife, was also one of the two writers and uh, contributed a lot of the overarching uh, plot. And finally, Alec Holoka, uh, who is best known for games like uh, Aquaria and uh, similar things, uh, was the primary coder and also did all the game's music. So everybody was doing everything on this thing, and there was... Uh, not much that could be pulled off the shelf that could be used to fit into this particular mold. So in a narrative game, the dialogue and the gameplay tend to be very, very closely meshed together. And your conversations have choices, and those choices affect the gameplay state. Night in the Woods is a very, very linear uh, talk. So th 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 uh, there was a talk yesterday about uh, linear narrative and how and, uh, Night in the Woods was mentioned as an example of chained narrative. So while there are choices, the story has one particular arc to it, and there's no you can't control the outcome very much. Um, so choices pop up. So for example, like B here is asking, should we get some lunch? And so we can choose, you know, we can choose, uh, pick, pick a thing here. So. When the main draw of your game is there's a lot of characters to talk to and a lot of things to do, then you can't really separate gameplay logic from narrative. So we're often quite used to this idea of uh, a technical program and a gameplay program and a writer being three separate people. And the writer gives the plot, the gameplay program integrates it, and then the technical programmer pr provides the systems that the gameplay program can work on. And in a team the size of Night in the Woods, that wasn't really an option. 
Additionally, because the gameplay is the narrative, the nameplay, and, and, and the narrative is the gameplay, that distinction doesn't really make much sense. So we needed a tool that was able to work uh, quite well in both departments at the same time. So one of the consequences of this kind of split is that your writer will end up uh, with, will come up with something cool that can happen with the players, with the characters, and that will at minimum need them moving around and talking to each other. So if the gameplay code and the dialogue aren't handled using the exact same systems, then you'll end up with a split, and then your cool stuff will not end up getting added. So when the entire game is that cool stuff, then you end up with a massive production problem. So we had to have a way to combine writing and scripting, but there was no time for anything. More importantly, there was no time for the writers to learn to, how to be programmers, and because there was just so much writing that they had to do, there was no time for them to skill up to that point. Now there's a lot of off-the-shelf tools for managing game dialogue that exist out there, and I'll take a bit of time to review some of the more notable ones, some of them you, you might have heard of, some of them you haven't. Now, I'm not mentioning these as like a list of things that Nightly Woods tried. So this is not like, we tried this, then this, and then finally Yarn Spinner. That's not really what happened. It was much more messy than that. Um, this is more, um, these are some alternatives to solving the problem that, that Yarn Spinner solves. So there are basically two different approaches for uh, managing dialogue in games. The first is a node-based approach. So in a node-based approach to dialogue, uh, each line of dialogue, or sometimes runs of contiguous um, uh, lines of dialogue, are represented by nodes, and those nodes are connected to each other, and you can visually see the graph. Um, so when you have a branch in the conversation, then this is visually represented by a, a split. You can, you can, you can look at and, and, and follow the, the, the path. The other approach is a scripting approach. So you write your dialogue as text. This means that if you have branching in your conversations, then that needs to get represented in a manner fairly similar to a programming language. So I'm going to take a look at some node-based approaches to dialogue management first and then we'll chat about the scripting approach, which is actually what Night in the Woods end up going with. So, ChatMapper is a fairly popular tool. It takes a node-based approach. It allows you to uh, map out your characters, map out the lines of dialogue that they speak, um, and you can fairly clearly see that like, there's, a, uh, there's a branch up the top there, that, uh, that narrow pinkish uh, box saying uh, action decision one, and so from there we have multiple uh, paths that can come out of that decision point. Um, as with most of these tools, they also tend to uh, load on top of this management of like story information. So like character motivations might get listed in these things. Um, overall uh, plot arc is, is often included in, the, in these things. Um, a product that takes this to what I think is kind of an extreme is Artisy Draft. Uh, Artisy Draft goes way beyond dialogue and actually presents itself as a tool for managing your entire gameplay. So it's a game design tool, so you can actually load up a map and draw, okay, at this bridge, then we'll trigger this conversation, double click on that, now we're looking at that particular graph of the dialogue tree. Um, so if you have a single like point of reference for your entire gameplay uh, arc, then that can be great. A lot of RPGs use um, Odyssey Draft for this reason, and it can export into, into some good formats as well. Night in the Woods actually used Odyssey for managing some of the high-level gameplay structure uh, and the story structure, although it was not used for dialogue. Um, the reason why we didn't use a, a node-based approach is there's just so many uh, lines of dialogue in this thing. Additionally, we wanted to have a lot of flexibility in uh, making last-minute changes to story, sorry, to a dialogue branching structure. We wanted to be able to jump in at, at the last minute and I think literally the last change to the dialogue happened half an hour before shipping, um, which is only possible because we weren't voice acting. Um, so if you have a node-based approach, that means that while it's very easy to visualize the path of this conversation, and you can, like, even though you can't read those words, you can see, okay, this is what the path would be, it makes it much more challenging to uh, rearrange and rewrite that tree. So, some text, sorry, some scripting-based approaches to this. This is Ink. Ink is fairly new. Um, this is actually Inky, the, uh, the editor for, for working in Ink. Ink is from Inkle Studios, and this is the tool that they wrote 80 Days in. Um, raise your hand if you've ever played 80 Days. Yeah, some of you. It was awesome. It's a fantastic game, and it's a really, really interesting exploration of the kinds of stuff that's possible with interactive fiction. 
Um, so Ink is actually, uh, this is actually part of the source code to uh, 80 Days. This is actually the opening of uh, 80 Days where um, the main character talks to, uh, to um, Phileas Fogg. And this is really amazing because it allows for stuff like rewriting the line that you were just reading. So um, approximately uh, two thirds of the way down there, there's a line that begins, ah, and then there's, then there's a full stop. Then afterwards, it continues, I, reply, uh, I replied, uncertain uh, what I thought. So what that presents as is the word R with a full stop and then nothing else. But when you click on that, the line then rewrites itself and completes the thought, I replied, uncertain what I thought, which is great um, for text games. Although Night in the Woods is not a, not a text game, it's a game that had dialogue in it. So this kind of rewriting wasn't really appropriate. Um, that said, uh, if you are writing any kind of choose your own adventure that is primarily uh, designed to be read rather than uh, played with in a game like uh, Night in the Woods, then this is a really cool choice. Um, who's used Twine before? Yeah, three quarters of the room. Um, Twine is an amazing tool for writing interactive fiction. It is a hybrid of a node and text-based approach in that you have nodes of text, Twine calls them passages, uh, passages can, can link to other passages, but they can also contain multiple runs of uh, text that all in the same node. So uh, the idea is that you would present like a page of text and then you'd have choices at the end and, and the player can jump between them. Now, Twine is great for a few reasons. One of the main reasons is that if you aren't a programmer, you can still get a lot out of it. But if you are a programmer, you can take it much, much further than it was originally intended to because you can just run JavaScript in this thing if you happen to know JavaScript. Now, Twine actually managed to be the uh, primary inspiration for the dialogue system that we use in Night in the Woods, as you'll see shortly. So um, yeah, Twine is excellent stuff, and I strongly recommend that you check it out if you have any even a passing interest in uh, interactive fiction. I cannot stress enough, Twine is amazing. So like The Late Show with Stephen Colbert made a game um, about uh, a couple of years ago uh, called Escape from the Man-Sized Cabinet, in which Stephen Colbert is locked inside a cabinet and you have to help him get out. Um, yeah. Uh, also, uh, you should play a game called The Writer Will Do Something by Tom Bissell and Matthew S. Burns. Um, it's one of the most incisive pieces on game dev culture that I have ever seen. Both of those written in Twine and uh, really, really worth your time. Now Twine's whole idea is that it focuses on your text. So code becomes secondary. You can write really complicated game logic in Twine if you want to, but for the most part, Twine gets out of the way of the writer. So here, for example, we have two passages of text. One that says, it looks like the blue key will open the door. And that last bit there is actually a link to another passage. And we're using logic, we're using conditionals, we're doing all this. And this is, this is kind of like the, the level of programming complexity that we find most writers are very comfortable with, even if they've never programmed before. Now, writers in games tend to know a bit more programming than uh, anything else, but Night in the Woods was actually Scott and, and Bethany's first game. So, yeah. Um, so at the same time um, as being able to give writers lots and lots of freedom to, uh, to, to write what they want to, when they want to, and how they want to, the system also needs to be expressive enough on the logic side for it to be useful for controlling the gameplay. All of Night in the Woods gameplay is done in Yarn Spinner using a scripting system that was also designed to deliver all the dialogue. So everything that happens in the game happens as a result of a combination dialogue and script here. So there's two main design goals here required for Yarn Spinner, and we think this is a fairly um, generalizable uh, set of uh, goals that most narrative games would want to have as well. The first is that we don't require the writers to have to learn how to code. We don't, have to give, we, don't, we don't give them a complicated system and then say, now learn all this, read the documentation, and then you'll be permitted to write the story. So this was designed to make it as easy as possible for uh, Scott, who wrote most of the dialogue in the game, to write the conversations while also being able to keep the high level structure of what was required in a scene in his head. And at the same time, the system also needs to be useful for a programmer who is constructing the logic of those scenes. So the end result was what we shipped, which was, not, uh, which was uh, Yarn Spinner. So let's take a look at what this tool is now that I've given you the background. Yarn Spinner is a dialogue system that works by reading Yarn scripts and then sends lines of dialogue to your game for display. And it's also a full programming language and is useful for scripting the entire gameplay. 
So yarn spinner works by reading scripts written inside the uh, written in the yarn language. So we'll take a look at uh, what yarn looks like in a second. Um, yarn scripts are uh, edited using the yarn editor, which is a piece of cross-platform software that we wrote for uh, editing it. Uh, most of that in the woods was written inside this editor here, and it's free. It's open source. You can grab it, and it runs on most platforms. It looks like this. So this is the yarn editor. And as you can see, it's pretty similar to Twine. We've got nodes, we've got nodes linking to other nodes, we've got text inside those nodes. Drilling down into one of the uh, pieces of, uh, actually I'll come to that in a second. Um, so you can download, uh, you can download the, uh, the editor at this URL and also be showing these links at the end as well. So don't feel like you have to rush to write these down. So in Yarn, um, each node here is a block of yarn script, and the yarn editor detects the connections between those nodes and then draws lines between them. Um, so this is actually a chunk of uh, some of the source code to Night in the Woods. This is actually the script that controls a character called Laurie, who you meet fairly early in the game. So now that we know what the structure of these kinds of things is like, let's take a closer look at one of these nodes. So here's a simple conversation. May says, sup. B says, sup. Here's that entire script. So this is, I think, the simplest possible Yarn script. Um, in Yarn, lines of text are dialogue. So there's no special command needed to say, tell the character to deliver this. It's just if there's a line of text, then that becomes a line of dialogue shown in the game. Um, almost all of your Yarn text, almost all the contents of your script is going to be dialogue. So the language makes a lot of effort to go out of your dialogue's way. Um, each line here is just given to the game as plain text, um, and uh, what Night in the Woods itself, that's something that's specific to this game does, is it actually looks for everything up to a colon, and goes, okay, May is saying this, I'll associate that line with this character on the right-hand side here. So I'll just position here so you can see it a little better. So, yeah, um, that's one example of the kind of things uh, that uh, Night in the Woods' engine does with the lines of text that it receives from Yarn, and I'll talk more about those kinds of things uh, shortly. So we also have choices as well. Uh, in a narrative choice-driven game, then choices are kind of the bread and butter of your, uh, of your gameplay. So we can pop up uh, a choice like this, and what we do there in, in Night in the Woods is we receive the callback from, um, from Jan Spinner saying, OK, here are choices. We then display them inside the speech bubble. So we can choose between these two things. And this is what that looked like. So we ran a line of uh, text where B says the line, this thing's going pretty well. And then we have this syntax where we display um, Two possible options, one is the text is it, the other is the text I guess, and those link to nodes, one called is it, and that's an internal name, and the other one called I guess, which is again an internal name. So Yarn is designed for making it very easy to do branching narratives. So when execution of that Yarn script, which happens top to bottom, hits the end of a node, then any options that it encountered is sent to the game, and then the game presents it in whatever UI is most appropriate. Um, behind the scenes, what's happening here is Night in the Woods is receiving an array of strings, and then Yarn Spinner waits for a callback. So Night in the Woods, after having presented everything, when the player presses the yes, choose this option in the dialogue, it then calls a function back into Yarn Spinner and goes, okay, brilliant, it was option one, I'll run the first line there. So the Yarn editor then detects that that's your structure. So here's the complete dialogue here. So the other option would have been, um, if, if I'd chosen is it, then B would say, I mean, nothing major is broken yet. So this really helps to visualize your branches while still giving you lots of room for writing you know, in a very freeform way. You can also jump directly to another node using this syntax. So this is a good technique for breaking up your nodes into multiple you know, lines. So rather than having a single uh, enormous uh, node, which can be difficult to read and visualize, um, it's often easier just to break into smaller chunks and just have links between them. So it's a good tool for managing your dialogue this way. Now, not all of your choices have to have huge uh, ramifications for overall story structure. Something that we, that we notice happens a lot is players like having lots of little choices. So Yarn features a syntax for writing these short branches. Um, we call these shortcut options. Um, if you ever played uh, the original Mass Effect 1 game, um, 
many of the choices that you make don't actually impact the conversation at all. They're just there so you can make a choice rather than you sitting there watching lines scroll past. Shepherd says a thing, other characters says a thing. You can choose to say, uh-huh, or cool. Both of them go to the same point, but it feels like you said something. You know, you're contributing to the, to the conversation. So these shortcut options, this is actually the code that, you, that, we, that we ran earlier when B asked, do you want to get some lunch? Um, by, uh, with this little arrow syntax, um, we say, okay, these are the options that we display, and then the indented code here is what runs if that is chosen. So you can write these really quickly, and that means that uh, we can very quickly add in lots and lots of branching and divergence and, and um, giving the... So after... We, uh, if I'd chosen, nah, I'm good, B would have said, oh, okay, we then set a variable, I'll come to variables in a second, and then uh, the whole thing was skipped to the bottom of, the, of that block, and we continue on from there. So it means you don't have to create new nodes every time you want to have a, a, a player choice, which is, yeah, most of the choices in the game are written in this syntax. So as you just saw, yarn scripts can work with variables, and this, combined with shortcut options, is a great way to have little moments in your game that the game remembers, so it records state, and also helps your player noticing, uh, helps your, your player to notice that the game is noticing it as well. So for example, um, popping up a thing saying, oh, we still want for lunch, in this case, I chose yes in an early conversation branch, and so this presentation is remembering that. Now, yarn variables can be strings or numbers. They can be true or false, or they can be null. Um, how those variables get stored in your game is actually entirely up to you. So yarn spinner doesn't actually give you a data storage system. It actually just gives you an interface. You, you can then plug into that, and yarn spinner will say, hey, my script just told me to set this variable to this, this value. You deal with it. And that means that you can save it in a database, you can save it in your own save file. It's entirely up to you. So we don't actually make any kind of assumption as to how your data is managed. We just say, I need you to store this, and then later on, what's the value of this variable? Um, this means that Yarn plays really nicely with your existing save system. Now, flow control in other languages usually has a bunch of different flavors. So we have if else, we have switches, we have loops. Those are really common flow control structures that exist in other languages. But in a branching dialogue game, we don't really tend to need this very much. So uh, all flow control in a branching uh, game tends to be if statements. It tends to be, did we choose this path or this path? Loops don't really exist, and in fact, they're actively harmful, because if the player notices that the same line's been delivered over and over again, then that feels bad. Like, the only looping that we should be doing is stuff that's triggered by the player themselves. If you talk to the same person over and over and over, and over again, then you have an excuse to loop, and even then, maybe you should consider doing some other logic to prevent that. So the only stuff that we do is, um, uh, is if statements. We might end up adding switches later on, but so far that hasn't been necessary, and we don't plan to add loops at all. Now, a line of dialogue isn't the only thing that might happen in your game. So, so far you've seen choices, you've seen lines of dialogue, but we also have stuff like camera control, character movement, and all the other non-dialogue stuff that makes up a scene. So, we can have Greg run in here and uh, basically throw his arms around a little bit and have a great time, and then run off screen. <laughs> and that was done through this script. So the double chevron syntax allows us to specify just a, a chunk of text that actually just gets passed directly to the game engine. And it's up to the game engine to, to interpret that. So in this case, what it's doing is it's splitting based on spaces and going, okay, warp character Greg to a marker that I've called slides right off screen. Um, we then run an emoticon. I'll talk more about those in a second. Greg is then told to start running towards slide center, which is just in the middle of the screen there. He then delivers uh, a couple of lines. That actually happens while he's running. Um, and so two lines, in fact. Then um, the, the script then waits for any movement to complete. Greg then resets his emotional state. Uh, this is presented you know, emotional state. Um, and then he runs off. And then I wait for um, the, me to press the F key. So I'm now on the slide. That was that whole thing. So this command syntax is how you control what happens in the scene besides the text that you read. So with all of that in mind, um, let's talk a bit about how this gets integrated into a game. Now, Yarn Spinner specifically supports Unity, but we are working on some ports to other environments, and we very recently completed some work that will make it much easier to port to things like C++ and Swift and JavaScript. So that's cool. Um, 
I want to show you some uh, advanced usage of uh, Yarn Spinner as well, because what you've seen so far is the basic package of uh, things that Yarn Spinner can do. It can give you lines, it can give you choices, it can give you uh, commands. But the stuff that it gives your game, I've mentioned before, is primarily plain text, and so you can interpret that plain text however you want to. So we did a lot of this in Night in the Woods. The lines of dialogue that we send to you are plain text, so if you process this with a bit of markup, then you can add all kinds of stuff. So for example, um, the word spooky here is waving. That's being done with a little bit of markup. So anytime you want to add a bit of flavor to the presented text, because as I mentioned, there's no voice acting in Night in the Woods, but there's a tone present in the speech balloon that wouldn't have been really possible. Like there's, well, you, you actually see a thing that wouldn't have been possible in uh, a voice acting game at all anyway. So, so that was that. So that's the entire uh, markup there. Now this isn't, uh, that, that isn't Yarn Spinner, that actually, that's actually Night in the Woods seeing, oh, here's a square bracket, wave, close square bracket, and I'll actually run my own processing on top of that. So, um, that, and it also has support for like setting the text color in Night in the Woods. It's very similar to BB code if you've used Peach BBB. Um, so, we can do stuff like this, where like, there are points in the game where May's really upset. And so, what we do is we actually scale the text up and start shaking all the letters around. So the game, again, doesn't have any voice acting, so we have to do all of our emotion via this kind of visual approach. So that text is marked up, marked up like this. So we just set a shaking factor, we set a size, we also, again, um, there's another example of an emoticon. Now, dialogue doesn't always have to be textual. So there are moments in the game where like, it makes no sense for us to be displaying everything in words when we could do the same thing with pictures. So. Um, in Night in the Woods, we have support for both static and animated images. Uh, so... <laughs> so that was basically, we have a special... Like if, if May is told to say a certain special word, then it says don't show that text, actually just show a static uh, animated image as well. So another way that we get characters in Night in the Woods to express themselves is with body language, and we control those via emoticons. You've seen a few of those already. Um, so an example here, um, we're controlling May's uh, facial expression. It's a little bit hard to see because her contrast is amazing, but she has her arms thrown up while saying woo. Um, we're also controlling her face as well. And that was done with this. So those plain text um, Smileys that we used to use before emoji were a thing um, are, are there. Um, that's never exposed to the player, except insofar as it triggers an, an animation system. So when Greg was fla flailing his arms a, a few moments ago, that was done via a very similar emoticon string. So we get really expressive outcomes, and one of the things that uh, happened towards the end of the game was after the dialogue was written, um, people would actually go through and just add these emoticons, just add an acting level to it, which is kind of fun. Now you can expose functions from your code to Yarn Spinner as well, which it can call. So you can actually define a function in your program and then hand it over to, uh, to, uh, to the scripts, and those scripts can then call it. Um, that's kind of a complement to, uh, uh, to the commands system. The difference being that a function can actually return a value. So you can say, hey, count the number of times I've visited this node before, and use that to run a different line of text. So it, that's one approach we have for uh, resolving the problem of talking to the same character over and over again. We actually can run different lines. Yarn Spinner is open source. Uh, it's released under the MIT license, which means you can use it in both free and paid projects as long as you give attribution. It is uh, the result of a number of community contributions, and because, and because it's open source, anyone can contribute. A number of really cool features that actually end up shipping in Night in the Woods uh, came as a result of people you know, contributing to the game. Uh, and uh, via um, uh, Yarn Spinner's source code. Um, so yeah, it isn't, it isn't free for all. We aren't like a wiki. Um, I have uh, a final say on what gets merged or not, but um, yeah, there's some really good stuff happening in, in here. Um, you can help me make this thing. Uh, so we have the whole thing hosted on GitHub and I'm, and I'm fairly open with, um, uh, with pull requests. So if you want to check it out, um, it's lab.2 slash yarn dash spinner. And uh, again, I'll have that link up on the last slides as well. So we also have a very, very cool game, uh, narrative game dev Slack as well, which uh, we have a number of very cool people in there, um, like me. <laughs> um, so you can find it there, and again, I'll, I'll have that so much. 
Thank you so much for uh, listening. Please uh, follow me on Twitter and tell me about your awesome thing. Um, and uh, farewell to these two characters as well. All right, and the uh, links to uh, everything that I talked about uh, is here. I'll leave these up on screen, so if anybody wants to write those down, then they uh, uh, can. I also have another slide after this as well. Um, we have plenty of time for questions as well. So if you have any questions um, or want to start thinking of them, then that's awesome. So I'm, I'm going to move to the next slide in a second, but if you want to, I'll move back to this one as well. Um, I am uh, Displaster on Twitter. Um, please follow everybody else here. So um, Night in the Woods game, and you should go on totally go and buy it because it's an awesome game. Uh, Finji, the publisher, uh, The Secret Lab, which is my studio, and also you can find our um, uh, webpage there. So yeah, hopefully that was interesting to you, and uh, yeah, go and do some cool stuff with Yarn Spinner. Did anybody have any questions? Um, and I, do we have, I don't know if we have a mic for, uh, for questions or not. We don't? Okay, that's all right. Okay. Yes? Um, you said that to assign the different lines to a main V, you used, uh, um, from what I gathered, you said it was something specific to Knife in the Woods and not to Yarn Spinner, is that right? Yeah, so what that's doing is, when it receives a line of text, it actually will uh, split it at a colon. So it'll actually find a colon and go, okay, so everything before the colon is the name of a character. I'll now do a lookup in the scene and find the object in the scene called May. Um, so that, that kind of has to be specific to Night in the Woods um, because like, it, it has its own lookup system for working out what objects are doing what. But it's really straightforward because all you have to do is like, do a, 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 in Unity, we just go find object by name, um, pass in May, go, okay, she's here, now we'll position the speech bubble. So, while it is not built in, I don't think that's a huge feature that, uh, yeah. And like other games where you don't attach the, um, uh, the speech balloon to a person, like where the dialogue is always in the same place, like, like we make no assumption about how your game does it, is, is my point. Yeah. Question. Um, I just looked at the Yarn Spinner page, which is a GitHub repo. Yes. And I was wondering if there was some sort of standalone editor, like how Inkle has ink where you could write the script and then like down the line, fine. Do you mean like running the, uh, the, the script that you've written inside an editor? Or no, well, yeah, you know, if you're coming in as a writer and you don't really have the programming side, being right. able to like write the script out beforehand. Right, so we don't have any uh, software right now that will let you test your dialogue outside of the built game, mm -hmm. but that is something that I plan to change because you know, it's very, very cool to be able to test a dialogue yeah. without having to, uh, because this is the full game. Like, I hope that was fairly obvious. Like, this, is, this is Night in the Woods. And so that means that uh, to test this slideshow, I had to build the game, um, and that was onerous enough. Like, if you're writing a, a narrative on top of that, then that's, yeah. Can I just add to that, Robert Yang actually created a little um, yarn spinner uh, running tool specifically oh, for Oh like, yes, yes it is. Um, I can't, I the URL for that, yeah, I can't easily uh, tab out of this because again, <laughs> video game, but um, uh, if you search for yarn weaver, then that's the name of that tool. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions I can answer? Yes. I was just wondering, do you um, interpret the script at runtime in the game or do you still compile it from the it's compiled, but that compiled representation is uh, generated at game launch. So we aren't compiling to bytecode and then keeping the bytecode around. Um, it isn't interpreted line by line, if, if that, was, that was what your question was. Yeah, so Inc. Yeah, uh, Inc. will compile everything down to a binary format and then run that binary format. And that's, that makes a lot of sense for them uh, because um, they have just enormous amounts of logic and, and, and text, and so compiling that at runtime is a bad idea. Because we were making changes until the very last second, um, we didn't want to add another step before you could build the game, because there, there was just no time for it. So, yeah. Um, the, the performance of the compiler is, could be improved, um, but uh, right now it's doing okay. We'll probably end up adding in support for like, offline compilation as well later on. That's basically right, yeah. Um, we actually, so, so we actually use a full compiler stack. So um, I wrote a, a, a full compiler by hand for this. Um, don't do that, that's a bad idea. But it was fun. As I moved to Bandana earlier, we've kind of been, you know, Tim has been pouring the whole thing to Antler, which is a software generator, which means you've got to move the whole thing to other languages. Yeah. To work with other languages. Yeah, so we've already seen some, some encouraging stuff with uh, JavaScript. Not yet. <laughs>
No, uh, no we don't. We don't currently have a, a, a publicly released version of the JavaScript uh, uh, compiler because right now it doesn't actually support the entire language and also is super hacky and we know nothing about JavaScript. But pull requests are welcome. Okay. So it'll probably end up being interpreter, honestly, because that's a lot easier than a yeah. compiler initially. Uh, mm. and the goal is to eventually then create a compiler, but we know so little about JavaScript. <laughs> yeah. It, it would be embarrassing to try and do it properly on the first approach. Mm. Okay. Are you going to have more implementation examples uh, for things like markup and? Yes. Design? So the the intent is um, soon uh, Janssen will actually uh, ship with uh, more than just the basic templates of hey look you can walk to a character and press a spacebar and get dialogue. We'll have more like you know data storage and I don't want to turn it into a kit for making narrative games. I, I, I want to keep it as like a module that can be, can be plugged into an existing thing. But uh, yeah, what I have found that is. A lot of game developers who are very new to game development um, don't make many changes based off our existing stuff. And so there's a lot of games out there with example dialogue UI.cs as their as their main driver for dialogue. So that's the thing that I want to improve. Good. Yes. Um, when you mentioned that there wasn't support for loops in your system. That's right. Um, but is that that there's an like in in script looping because it looks like you could just have it go back to an existing. Code. You absolutely can. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So a note you you can have uh, looping achieved by circular references to nodes if you really wanted to. Um, that's not recommended, but um, I mean you could if you wanted to. Um, we don't. Yeah. We have no syntactic support for loops, but you can loop if you if you really feel you must. Okay. Um, did I see someone raise their hand? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so that's all achievable with the existing if statement system and variables. So um, Night in the Woods actually keeps so, so Night in the Woods save games are nothing more than a dump of all the yarn variables. So all of the game logic I mentioned is done inside yarn, and what that means is when you talk to a character, it does a whole bunch of checks on existing variables and then chooses which node to jump to or which options to present to the player. So you, you would have that kind of system by saying, okay, you've got a, a, a variable called renegade, and then if renegade is greater than 10, then also show this option. Cool. Yeah, so you can do, uh, the, the whole thing is designed around uh, a, a really like, sparse representation of gameplay, so we make no, th there's no data structures in this, there's no uh, assumptions made about what your character layout is gonna be, just that there's information and that'll choose, that'll affect what your gameplay choices are. <laughs>